So I want to go a little bit off topic of the 86th legislature to begin and 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 t tie our conversation as we start to the news. We had uh, a mass casualty incident involving uh, a semi-automatic weapon this weekend in Odessa. A month earlier, we had a mass casualty incident involving an automatic weapon in El Paso. We are not alone in this. There have been a number of these incidents around the country. Texas, unfortunately, now has the distinction of having four of the eight incidents in history with the most casualties involving a weapon. Um, it's very sad, and of course we, we grieve for the loss of life in those two cities, and we hope that those communities are rebuilding, but it is of course occasioned in our world a conversation once again about guns, and whether at the Capitol in Austin we should be talking about guns and gun laws differently than we have been. I know we're in East Texas. Representative Ashby. I understand this community's view of the Second Amendment and of gun ownership. I get that. But on behalf of the entire state, should we be talking about this issue differently after El Paso and Odessa? Well, first off, Evan, let me, uh, let me welcome you and the Tribune team Thank here you. to uh, Lufkin and the beautiful campus here at Angelina College. Uh, it's great to see such a a large audience with us today, uh, and as we refer to it here locally, we're just glad to have you in God's country. So okay. appreciate you making the trek over. Great. The um, the, the the situation uh, in Odessa most recently, and of course also within the month of August uh, in El Paso, uh, is is tragic. It's horrific. Um, and you go back even farther, looking at Sutherland Springs and. Uh, the campus situation that occurred in Santa Fe. Uh, these uh, mass acts of violence uh, against our citizenry, um, they should not stand. Uh, and they do demand action. And I have been really uh, delighted to see the outpouring of support uh, for action, uh, as well as the grieving process that's occurring. I know the folks here in Lufkin and Angelina County and all across East Texas, uh, we share that grief. Uh, with our fellow Texans and our neighbors uh, in those communities that have been impacted by these senseless tragedies. And so as we think about where we go from here, uh, I have been heartened uh, to see that the leadership of our state uh, has stepped forward. Uh, I understand today there was, uh, before, right before we came on stage, uh, the governor has issued uh, eight executive uh, orders. Uh, also, of course, uh, as all of you or most of you probably have heard, uh, Earlier this week, both the House and the Senate leadership uh, took decisive action in creating uh, select committees that will study this issue of mass violence in our communities and what we can do proactively to try to promote uh, or prevent these type of tragedies from occurring. And so uh, you know me, most of the folks in this audience know me, uh, I'm, I'm a very cautious individual um, when it comes to policy. Um, I, I'm always careful not to let emotion drive sound public policy. And so I was really glad to see the speaker and the lieutenant governor uh, stand up these two committees uh, of, of a, in a bicameral and a bipartisan manner work together to hopefully bring some ideas to the table that we as legislators and policymakers that we should be considering. You know, I don't expect, I'm not going to get out in front of those two committees. I was very pleased with the makeup. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the composition, uh, but there's no question that doing nothing is not an option. And so, but lastly, to your point about the Second Amendment, uh, there's no question that the Second Amendment uh, is sacrosanct uh, in lots of, or if not all of, across uh, rural Texas, especially here in East Texas. And so anything that uh, is brought to the forefront for public discussion, Evan, I think uh, has to be uh, measured uh, and I think it certainly uh, cannot infringe upon that constitutional right. Senator Nichols, do you understand the tendency after an incident like this for people to, to call for some change to the way we do things? Um, it's you, human nature, is it not? It, it is. Uh, and and there's, it's not an overreaction. It's horrible uh, what has happened and has continued to happen, not right. just in Texas, but also uh, throughout the nation and unfortunately may continue. Um, and the, it's a very natural instinct to call leadership to take action, tell the legislative body to take action, 
uh, all actions are not necessarily gun related. There may be other things that we can do. Well, in fact, the executive orders that Representative Ashby referred to, eight executive orders, none specifically related to guns that the governor took. Correct. Right. And so the committees that the House and the Senate have put together, that is exactly what they're going to be looking at, as I understand it from talking right. to the lieutenant governor. They will break them into different categories, mental health, guns will be obviously one of them, but there'll be a lot of other categories of what can we do in this area, in this area, in this area. Right. And, and once those committees have completed their work, uh, we may be facing looking at this legislatively in the next session, or if the governor chooses to have a special session, it's his prerogative, then he might choose to have a special session. Do you think, Senator, this rises to the level of bringing everybody back to Austin? If the committees can come up with what we think are reasonable solutions and options, I personally do not think that you can eliminate all of it, but you may be able to eliminate some of it. And if you can eliminate right. some of it, that would be a good thing. Uh, if you get in, first thing people look at is gun, guns, gun control, things like that. You look around the nation, uh, I look at Chicago, probably has the most gun regulated regulations of any city in the nation, but also has one of the highest homicide rates and gun uh, crime rates in the nation, yet they are the most regulated. So regulating right. is not necessarily the answer because the people, and, and uh, really bad people, and we're dealing with assassins here, uh, they're not going to follow the law. No matter what laws we put on the so, books, so, they're not going to follow them. So let me just ask the two of you. I, I wanted to touch on this. I appreciate your perspective on this. I want to go to the broader conversation about the legislature, but I want to ask you about a couple of the things that have been floated as proposals in polls where the public has weighed in. This is representative democracy, right? You represent the public, your public. Quinnipiac poll last week, after Odessa, after El Paso, pardon me, but before Odessa, 93% of the public polled said they supported expanded background checks for people who purchase weapons. Let me just ask you, yes or no, would you be willing to entertain a revision to the laws with background checks, yes or no? I can't give you a categorical yes or no. I would need to see the specific It would proposal. have to be specific. Absolutely. Would you be willing to talk about uh, uh, revising the background check when individuals buy guns from a stranger, the private, so-called private sales, which apparently was the case in Odessa with this individual? I'm going to give you the same Again, answer. Again, you're not, you're not prepared to say without seeing specific <laughs> Absolutely. legislation. Absolutely. That's right. Do, do, the, do the thought of expanded background checks strike you as something you'd be willing Anytime to do? Anytime somebody says, well, the polls say this or that, the only poll that matters to me are the people in this room and the people in my district, what they think. Right. Uh, that's who I represent. And polls, you can ask questions in different ways and you can get different answers. But the facts that I have been given, which I think are very interesting, y'all may find it interesting, is that You've got 80% of all the guns that are bought are bought through dealers where they have your normal background check. 20% don't have background checks. It can be a family to family, a family to friend. I might give my brother a gun. That's half of the 20, in other words, 10%. The other 10% are stranger to stranger. Right. Now, 80% of all the crimes committed by guns are from that 20%. That tells me we probably have an opportunity to tighten some of that up. Now, I don't know. I don't have a problem with family to family, but I see an opportunity where you're not going through background checks. And I think most reasonable people, this is just my opinion, would think that that probably, right. especially so, when so they you're, know you're that 80 percent of the, yeah. those crimes are committed by that group. Right. Most reasonable people, I think, would think that's reasonable if you can set it up. Right. So that it's not too cumbersome or expensive, that okay. that would be reasonable. So you're, you're open to that idea. Well, we'll see what the byproducts of this legislative work uh, is, as you say. Uh, let, me, let me say something else. Yeah. Another figure I heard the other day, which really caught me by surprise on the last two days, was that when you're filling out background checks at gun stores, um, the, the number I heard was 700,000 times in the United States. A felon falsely filled it out, and it was kicked back. 700,000 times, and that's perjury, yet there was not a single enforcement of the law for lying and trying to do to that. buy a gun, right. Yeah, to me, there ought to be some kind of a punitive effort when you're a felon and you knowingly falsify 
a gun reform. Well, again, like maybe that's something that the legislature takes up in the course of the next couple of months of, of work. So where we've been traveling around the state since the end of the legislative session to the big cities, we've said, was this a good session for El Paso? Or was this a good session for Houston? Was this a good session for Dallas? I want to ask the two of you if you think, in view of the challenges in rural Texas, whether this last legislative session was a good session for rural Texas. You know the things that I know. Population in rural communities is declining. Most of the population growth between now and 2050 is going to be in the metropolitan counties. Rural hospitals are closing in Texas at a higher number than in any other state in the country over the last 10 years. The smaller school districts have particular challenges, even when you reform school finance. So Representative Ashby, as someone who cares about rural Texas, do you think rural Texas got a good deal out of this last session? The answer is unequivocally yes. Uh, this was, in my fourth session now, this was probably the best session, uh, in my opinion, that we've had for rural Texas. Uh, you know, you had a, a nice list there of some of the challenges that we face right. uh, across rural Texas, but certainly here uh, more acutely in East Texas, and, and we're not immune to any of those. Right. Uh, and so when you, you know, I could almost address them individually, but at, on a, at a high level, generally speaking, uh, for let me take one example here. Uh, you know, as I look in the audience, I see a lot of uh, administrators, uh, some teachers and educators, and, you know, don't believe what I say, believe what they say, the folks that are on the front line. You know, uh, this was by far with uh, our landmark bill of House Bill 3, most comprehensive education uh, finance bill that we passed maybe in the history of the state. This was a win for rural school districts. Investing money in education and compressing school taxes so that homeowners, regular folks That's felt, right. felt the relief. Absolutely, and and as I travel around, and and I suspect Senator Nichols is probably he probably hears the same thing. We overlap in four counties, you know. It's it's almost universal when I go to do my town halls or when I talk to different groups and I ask for questions. Pe people want to know what are we doing to address those challenges? What are we doing to help our rural schools across Texas, many of which had been struggling to keep their doors open? What are we doing to retain and recruit qualified teachers to rural Texas? What are we doing to arrest the decline of rural hospitals across our state, right. several of which are right here in East Texas? Uh, so I believe, again, as a body of work, when you look at, and again, if we need to get you know more granular, I'm happy to. Yep. But I think that this session, we made great strides in towards proving the quality of life and addressing some of the countertop issues. Right. For Texas. So, Senator Nichols, it was the public education bill to which Representative Ashby re refers. You know, anytime anybody in Austin refers to something as historic, it almost certainly isn't. <laughs> but, but in fact, this probably walks up to the line of legitimately being historic. It was a more than $6 billion investment into public education, another $3 billion or so, close to $3 billion to buy down uh, uh, the, the property tax piece. About $5 billion on property tax relief. I mean, it's a, a lot, it's a lot of money altogether when you count the school and the other. Uh, you are paying teachers more. All of a sudden, everybody loves full day pre-K. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in this bill for people in the education community to like, right? Uh, he, he did not underestimate what the importance of it. Uh, it was rural East Texas and rural West Texas. Rural Texas came out great. Uh, in my opinion, it was the best overall rural session in over 30 years, uh, particularly for public education. And for most people, the education, the, we deal with a lot of issues. Right. But the, the number one issue, in my opinion, is and always will be public education, the education of our children, the importance of each of us educating the next generation to follow so that they can uh, take care of themselves and keep your democracy and compete in a world uh, economy. But it really was. And so I will tell you, as we study the math, he, uh, Trent, is, I'm thrilled to death that he's on the education committee. And being on the education committee, we look to him to help shape some of the ideas uh, that got into those bills. And so I'm very appreciative of his work uh, for all of us. Uh, but I will tell you, rural Texas came out better than urban what Texas. What was the most important thing in the public education bill, Senator Nichols, for the school districts in your district? What two, was the most important thing? Th there's two that two. are most important. One was the basic allotment was raised. Everybody got $1,000 per child more. More. Right. That's urban and rural. Right. 
But since the late 70s, rural small schools, and I'm talking about it's under 1,600, there's 850 rural schools under 1,600. They have been fiscally, fiscally, dollar-wise, punished since the late 70s just for being a small school. Right. That's hard to believe. I learned it 12 years ago after I got in the Senate. But literally, the urbans forced a punishment fiscally for being small and said, you have got to consolidate. And they wanted the small counties to have uh, uh, countywide school districts. Well, we didn't do that. Each community has their own identity. They're the pirates, they're the bulldogs, and so on. And I'm not so sure bigger is better. And so we've been punished. And so I learned that 12 years ago. We've been trying to change it. Finally, two years ago, 2017, we've, it's almost a billion dollars. And so we have to convince the urban members who control 80% of the legislature to give up a billion dollars of their money to fund these small rural schools to, to eliminate the penalties. That's a hard sell when there's only 20% of us. But we did it in 2017. It was a six-year phase in, but when the bill got over to the Senate last three weeks, we found out they put the penalties back. And we had a heck of a battle on the Senate floor with amendments trying to eliminate the amendment. And we didn't think it would pass, but the argument's there. Why try to balance the books in the urban areas over the backs of the small rural schools? And we shamed them. And so when the votes came in, the initial vote was 18 to 13 rural in rural's favor. By the time the final votes came in, it was 21 to 10. So you got it done. So the penalty is gone. Gone. Right. And we did it with uh, uh, bipartisan support, ours indeed, and we did it with uh, urban support. Even the urbans agreed. So the rural schools, particularly the small ones, not only picked up the $1,000 per child. If you've got 24 children in a classroom, that's $24,000. Uh, they also picked up the elimination of the penalty. Yep. So a lot of the small schools, if y'all talk to your superintendents, you will find out they gave some great teacher raises. Right. And, and so let's talk about the teacher piece of this, Representative Ashby, because this was a focus from the very beginning of the session. We have a profession where kids are choosing, who might have once upon a time chosen to go into public education, teachers were choosing to go into other professions, in part because the base pay for teachers was so low. You all committed at the beginning of the session to get the base pay up. Now, there was some disagreement about exactly how to do that, whether it should be merit-based, if it should be across the board, but you ultimately are putting more money into teacher salaries in a way that probably revives the prospects for the profession. Absolutely. There, I, I think you uh, characterize that perfectly. Um, you know, Senator Nichols mentioned was two key parts of House Bill 3. He talked about the uh, the equity piece in terms of the increasing the, base of the, uh, the right. basic allotment. The other part of that, I don't know if this is what you were going to say, but I would submit if I were answering that would be what you're talking about, increasing teacher pay. And we did it in a way that I feel like uh, most Texans agree with. And that is, when it comes to our teachers, our school districts, you know, those that are closest to the fire fight at best. And that's our local school districts and our school board members. And having been one, you know, I take a lot of pride in allowing our local officials to govern the job that they're elected to do. And what I loved about this pay raise idea that we put in two billion dollars I might add for pay raises across the state is we allowed the flexibility yeah. of our local school boards to make the decision on what those teachers should be paid and just in my six counties um, I don't know what all of them did over the last few weeks but I know that uh, in in several cases they gave the minimum of 30 percent which was put into the statute that you had to give at least 30 percent of your new money under House Bill 3 to teacher pay raises, but I know of a district out in the western part that gave 70% right. of their new money, and it was to arrest the decline of losing teachers to, in these cases, the suburban areas around primarily the Houston. Where, where they could have afforded to pay more. That's exactly right. Right. Uh, Representative Nichols, uh, the, the property tax component of this legislation was, again, intended to rebalance the seesaw so that the state's share of public education funding would go up as taxpayers' contribution to public education funding would go down. We've been here before where the state, which does not levy a property tax, nonetheless monkeyed with the way property taxes were assessed <laughs> so that we all were supposed to feel some relief. 
I remember in 2006 when the franchise tax uh, 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 swap happened and we were all told you're going to get a property tax cut, but people didn't actually feel it back home. Are we going to, as individuals, feel the property tax reform that you all put into effect this time? You said Representative Nichols. Yeah. Like. Senator Nichols, That's I'm sorry. Right. Be yeah. careful giving him a promotion here on stage. Uh, <laughs> it is a promotion. Yeah. These days being in the House may be a promotion. That's right. uh, and the answer yeah. is yes. Yeah. Uh, the way the compression rates worked before, schools in effect were almost forced to keep their property tax rates up. And it wasn't so much around here, but as you get into the urbanized areas where your property value is really shooting up, the closer you get to like Houston or Dallas, uh, people are saying 8 10% per year compounded. Right. The, and so we changed the formula. And so the formula is no longer an incentive for the state to keep it that way. The, 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 the schools are maxed out at 2.5% without a public vote. But also we changed the formula so the state is forced to put in more money. Right. And, and, and the, the state was spending, Senator, the state was contributing about 36 37% of public education funding before this bill. Now it's in the mid-40s. Right. Yes, so the I'd, state's uh, taking on a much larger share. I'd heard 38, but yeah, it will, the state will be putting a larger amount. Yeah. Now, it's going to be, and, and in 2020, your tax rate on your school portion should be $0.08. Cents. We bought that down. $0.08 cents per 100 lower. Right. And in 2021, $0.13 cents per $100. So if I live lower. in this community, if I live in one of your counties, what's the real dollar effect of this property tax change? going to be in my wallet every year. It won't be on this one. We couldn't change it in time without but in disrupting. The next. But in the next two, you'll see a slight reduction. Right. That, that would be my guess. A couple hundred period. bucks a year per valuation. Depends on the of, size of your house. Yeah. Right. But you, you feel like the juice was worth the squeeze on this, Representative Ashby? Absolutely. Senator Ashby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, uh, the other side of the House Bill 3 is what we're talking about on the on the tax relief side. And that's that's one of the other universal issues that I hear across rural Texas. It's uh, we're not immune from, uh, you know, increasing property valuations, taxes and whatnot. Appraisal and creep. Appraisal creep, which incidentally, uh, as I think about next session, probably one of the issues that uh, biggest issues that I hear about now today right. is I hear on one hand, thank you for the help on the property tax relief with M&O taxes with our school districts. However, the appraisal creep is killing us. And so I think looking kind of in my crystal ball towards the next session, one of the things that the legislature, and it won't be easy, but one of the things I think that we need to strike at is looking at uh, reining in the out-of-control skyrocketing appraisal increases. Isn't this, Representative Ashby, exactly how you all have approached every issue over the last couple of sessions? You said we don't want an unequal patchwork of regulations. You've got 254 counties. You have 254 different ways of calculating the appraisals of homes. Can't you come in and do appraisal reform behind the reform you just did and get a handle on this? Because there are a lot of people who think the problem is not so much property tax rates, it's appraisals. I, I couldn't agree more. And right. I hear that a lot echoed by my constituents. Uh, right. We appreciate the property tax help. As Senator Nichols said, we haven't seen the skyrocketing tax rate increases maybe that our suburban and urban brethren have. But what we do continue to see is significant increases in the appraisal valuations of our properties. And so one of the things that we can do to help homeowners and our business owners, right. uh, certainly that I, something I certainly work on every session, is try to provide them some tax relief in this area, which again speaks to your point about we've got to somehow rein in the appraisal, appraisal. increase side. Uh, S Senator Nichols, uh, during the session, late in the session, there was discussion of providing taxpayers even more property tax relief by buying down property taxes further, swapping out an increase in the sales tax. There was a discussion of increasing the sales tax, I believe, by a penny. Um, it didn't make this last session, but there is still a discussion of whether a sales tax for property tax swap should occur, some sense that maybe this is something you're going to talk about in the interim. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? It's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. Why? The, uh, it, the We had... Because of the continued pressure the legislature is going to have to properly fund education, it's going to dry up a lot of other issues that people want funding for. And there's always competition for money right. in the state budget. And so during the session, I know in the Senate, and I'm not sure exactly how they handle it in the House, but we put together a special committee, a task force, a work group, whatever you want to call it. Chair Nelson was the leader of this. And right to come there. up with various different options. Right. and and. 
some of the leadership actually said, well, what we need to do, because of the polling, this is why I don't always trust polling, polling said people would rather pay more in a consumption tax and have that consumption tax reduce their property tax. Right. Well, everybody's not in agreement. So there was a strong push to the membership to try to convince us to have a one cent sales tax increase. Uh, your sales tax is about eight and a half, eight and a quarter, something like that right now. Right. It would go up a whole penny to over nine cents. And if you wanted it to go to education, it would have to be constitutionally dedicated. And my, when they asked me about it, my first reaction was, well, wait a minute, you want me to go back to East Texas and tell people, well, we had to raise your taxes so that we could lower your taxes? Right. I said, I can't sell that. Well, now. that's the conservative argument against it is it's a tax increase. When did we Republicans in charge become yeah. the party of tax increases? But Representative so, Ashby, the other problem was that it was regressive, right? Right. That it, and we it sounded like we had a very similar discussion uh, yeah. in the in the Texas House about the issue of raising our sales tax a penny. And I won't uh, cover what Senator Nichols has eloquently done, but I will say that uh, there is a regressive uh, issue that you talked about. And you know, the other idea that was floated on the House side, and I don't know if this was looked at in the Senate, was uh, one one that I felt like had maybe some merit to it, and that was. Well, what if we allow the voters of Texas to decide this issue of raising our sales tax a penny? Put it on the ballot. Put it on the ballot. And, you know, I believe the voters in my district, matter of fact, I know my voters are smart. I believe the voters in Texas are, uh, are, can get this. And let's let them decide. You think they'd vote it down, Representative Ashby? I, I mean, think my voters would vote it down. Look at all those conservative states in the West that put legal marijuana on the ballot, and the voters said yes. Aren't you worried that they would do the same thing with the sales tax? There's, there's always that option, but again, Maybe I... Maybe there would need to be legal marijuana before they voted for the sales tax, actually. <laughs> right? I may have inadvertently lurched into the reality of this here. All right. Um, Re Representative Nichols, uh, Senator Nichols, I'm doing it again. Senator Nichols. Um, one of the things about this session, because the Speaker, Lieutenant Governor, and Governor were so firmly on the same page on property tax reform and education finance reform at the beginning of the session, is that if you were not worried about those issues specifically, it was very hard to get anybody's attention in this legislature. This legislature was largely, not exclusively, focused on those things. But there were two other big ticket items in the budget that East Texas cares a lot about, rural Texas cares about, that did not get a lot of attention. Healthcare we mentioned, we'll come to that second, but transportation is the other. This is an issue that you know as well as any member of the legislature having served on the Transportation Commission. Did you all do enough on transportation given the fast growth of this state and the needs we have now? Uh, the amount of taxation we have constitutionally dedicated for transportation, plus what I call it, all the tools that are in the toolbox, we are adequate to take care of this state. You feel okay about where we are now? If we are allowed to use all the tools. Right. <clears throat> and um, there's always going to be a push for more. And I know uh, I talked to a lot of the community. They feel like, well, the big urban areas get all the money. Well, that's not really the case. We yeah. got rural East Texas <clears throat> got a lot of transportation money. Uh, uh, there's a category we refer to as safety and there's billions of dollars of safety money. And you always see construction all the way around in different counties, adding shoulders, turn lanes, things like that. That's safety money, and it will save a lot of lives. It will also increase capacity. You'll see narrow two-lane roads being turned to three-lane, they call them with passing lanes up and down hills. Uh, we have $400 million of construction for I-69 on top of I-59 in a three-county area on each side of An Angelina County. Yeah. Rural East Texas. So even if you all didn't talk about mm -hmm. transportation as much as you may have in previous sessions, we know that these projects take a long time to get done. You've got plans in place where you feel like you're taking care of this issue. Yes. Yeah. Um, Representative Ashby, on the health care stuff, as I said at the beginning, we've lost more rural hospitals in Texas than any other state in the country over the last 10 years. We have an awful lot of people in Texas without health insurance. We have a doctor shortage in more than half of our counties. Did you all do anything on the issue of health care, and I just missed it during this session? It felt like one in which you were not really focused on health care. Well, I know you were busy. I think maybe you missed a, a few things that happened Tell uh, me. in this area. C correct me. So l let, me, let me set the stage here a little bit, though. As I said earlier at the outset of the discussion, since 2013, Texas 
has lost 19 hospitals in rural Texas. Several of those, some of, uh, no one who's in this audience, several of them in your communities, right here in our backyard of, of Angelina County. And so this right. is a, it's a very personal issue. I know Senator Nichols has at least, you have four, four of those 19 are in Senate District 3. So this is an issue that we're uh, very much focused on in terms of addressing in rural Texas. Now, as you start talking to folks in the healthcare profession about things that can be done, we are somewhat limited uh, as a state because so much of what drives our health care happens at a federal level. And when you start talking about, well, what's working and what's not, a lot of times, inevitably, it comes back to money. Well, we've seen significant cuts across the state in Medicare and Medicare reimbursement rates for our hospitals and our physicians. That is a big issue. We've seen a decline in our Medicaid reimbursement rates. That's been a big issue. Physician recruitment and retention, just like on our teachers earlier, major issue in East Texas. And one of the things that we did this session was a bill that I was very proud uh, to work with Senator Nichols on, which was House Bill 1065. And what it does, it creates a model and a program called the Rural Resident Training Program over at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And it sets up a model now to where we, as a state, put money into a program that simply incentivizes physicians, those that are going through the residency training to become a doctor, to do that training in rural Texas. It's a three-year track. The first year, you would be required to spend in an urban-suburban setting. But the last two years, you would be required to spend in a rural area of the state. And as the data supports, most physicians tend to live and stay in the communities where they train and do the residency. So what so, sort of an investment was that, Representative Ashby? How much money are we going to spend on that program? That was a little less than $2 million. Okay. And so I, we wanted a more, of course, right. uh, but baby steps. So we're starting the process now, creating a model uh, that we believe has worked, well, we know has worked in other states, and we're glad to, or at least yep. I'm glad to see it implemented in Texas. Senator Nichols, you agree with Representative Ashby that it is stuff at the federal level that is ultimately trickling down and causing the problems in your communities on health care that you feel? I would say it's primarily driven by, at the federal level. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and reimbursement rates, things of that nature. They set the pace. Uh, insurance companies try to follow, right. but there's too many people that don't have regular private insurance. Uh, I know we've got Blue Cross, Blue Shield, one of our sponsors, they're great, but uh, there's not enough people to cover. And and when you get into the rural hospital settings, the when they get into the formulas, they actually get paid less than they do in the urban areas for the same procedure and the diagnostic related groups. And when you buy a CAT scan or something in a rural area, you have fewer patients to amortize the cost over. So it actually costs more. All this equipment costs more. Uh, and we have to pay our people more. Yeah. Otherwise, they won't stay here. And it's just, it's a cost spiral going down. I, mean, I, I wonder just th thinking as kind of the average person, if the population of these communities is in fact declining, slowly but declining, are these... Uh, health care providers simply saying we don't have enough of a customer base to justify the expense of operating a facility in these communities, they're making a simple economic decision that any business might make if they saw their customer base and decline. I, doesn't mean it's good for the community. I will right? say, I, I, I have personally been on a rural hospital board, I'm a board, hospital board member today, yeah. and have been for over 35 years. Yeah. And so we have struggled through uh, every different type of payment system the federal government has created over right. the past three or four decades. And we, we literally, uh, you have to have the entire community pulling together to get, make that hospital work. Right. And, and uh, yeah, your patient base, your reimbursement rates, sure. the cost. It's I mean, this Representative Ashby is the challenge, right? If we think about the public policy portfolio as it impacts rural Texas, the population of these communities is lower than it's been, but there's still a million and a half people at a minimum, living in rural Texas. Senator Nichols and I had a conversation before we came up here today that it all really is about how you define rural. The fact is there may be even more people than that living in rural Texas, but take the most conservative number. Million and a half people living in rural Texas out of 29 million in Texas today. Doesn't sound like very many, but that's more than the populations of 10 whole states. Rural Texas would be the 41st largest state in the country. 
right? That's right. And, and Austin has got to pay attention to communities like this one when it comes to investing in public and health care. And all that. That, that's exactly right. And, and as was said earlier in your opening comments, the people that live uh, and work in rural Texas, they choose to do so at their own will. Right. We want to be here. We feel blessed to live, uh, in this case, in rural East Texas. I mean, this is an option, and we choose to live here. And so as a, a legislator, uh, you know, a big part of what I try to do is to make sure that our our urban and suburban brothers and sisters, that they understand that, A, that we are important and that we we do have a value system and unique challenges that have to be considered and have to be thought and heard. And sometimes that means that we as rural members have to work harder or smarter and, and certainly work in a bipartisan fashion uh, on issues like health care and education and others. And so, yes, we feel very strongly and adamant that Rural Texas matters, and I think it's also important to note that not, when you say rural Texas, you know, in, you know, you mentioned declining population several times. That's not the case in all of rural Texas. Right. For well, example, in, in many of the counties in East Texas, they're not declining. They're just not growing as not, rapidly. Not growing. And so I want to be clear, we're not declining necessarily in many of our counties in rural Texas. We're just not growing as fast. And so we just want you know, our fair share, we want right. to be heard, and that's a big part of what Senator Nichols and I do as legislators in Austin. Senator Nichols, one of the things I think about as I think about the future of rural Texas is there needs to be economic opportunity to create a reason for businesses to locate here and for kids who grew up here and may leave to go to school somewhere else to come back here, that there's really a reason to come back beyond being back in East Texas and being with family. One of the things that those of us who think about rural Texas think about often is availability of rural broadband. It seems like this narrow deal, but it's actually, it's a through line on everything. It relates to education. It relates to economic development. It relates to connectedness to the rest of the state and the rest of the world. I've seen a statistic that said that while 2% of urban Texas does not have access to rural broadband, as much as 25% of rural Texas does not have access to reliable broadband. Doesn't that create a problem from an economic development standpoint, from a population stability standpoint? from an education standpoint? Uh, you hit it on the nose. The, the, the percentage is much worse than that. Uh, when they're talking about everybody should have high-speed broadband in the urban areas, I try to remind them we're still working on self-signal. Uh, yeah. I've got probably... I drove here from Austin today and had a few uh, drop calls. I, I, I would say, ge right, I would say I geographically, yeah. <clears throat> my Senate district of 19 counties, probably 20 or 30% of it, has no cell signal. No cell service. And so broadband, you don't have broadband. I, I, we got into this issue. Of course, you know I carried a, a, a bill on that that yep. passed, but it was Senate Bill 14. But as we studied, uh, I, I was shocked to find out the federal definition of high-speed broadband is different for the urban areas and the rural areas. In the urban areas, it's 50 uh, megabyte downloads. But if you're rural, they consider it high-speed Internet, if it's 10, one-fifth. And I'm going, that's not right. And the only reason they do that is the percentages would be even worse than your yeah. numbers if you really had the percent of so is it the, is it the telecommunications companies that need to be brought on board with the idea that, the ha that having this is a public service, it's we a public good? We spent a lot of time with the telecommunication companies, the, t the cable guys, the telephone guys. Uh, it, they are for profit. We're not communists. Uh, they've got to make a profit. They have to have a rate of return. But can't and they be for purpose? In addition they to being cannot for make a good rate of return yeah. by running the, what needs to be run in the rural areas because they're so far apart. So right. we recognize that. Uh, the bill that we had uh, carried, Senate Bill 14, which passed overwhelmingly in the House and the Senate, uh, what I learned was rural, and we faced this before in rural Texas. Right. We did not have electricity. So if you get outside your towns in, in East Texas or West Texas, it's the electric co-ops. How many people in here get a bill from electric co-op? Yeah. That's okay. Much, yeah. Electric co-op. Uh, there are 300,000 miles, 300,000 miles in Texas of electric lines run by rural co-ops. But they were run before there was broadband. Yeah. And so all of those easements, millions of easements that were put in, say for electricity only, and they were unable to use those lines to run 
broadband. As a matter of fact, 150,000 miles of that already has the fiber optic cables going to all the houses. They manage your electricity. You get your bill off the fiber optic. So it's possible. They could put Netflix in one end real quick. Right. Uh, but they did not have the ability because of the easement. So Senate Bill 14, which everybody, urbans, rurals, RSD, it didn't matter. Everybody supported broadband for rural to allow those electric. So it passed. Now they have the ability to do that. Don't call your electric co-op and complain when you go home. They're studying it. We've got six co-ops that are implementing it right now in Texas. So it's going to happen eventually, just not right away. Right. As soon as those six right. implement it, Good. the remainders here in East Texas, I've talked to a lot of them, they're going to look and see, how did you do it? How did right. it work? They'll survey the membership. Everybody's going to want it. See if they can make it work. And then within two or three years, right. you'll start seeing a lot of activity. We're going to have questions in a second from the audience, and I'd encourage you all to come on and line up at the microphones. But I want to talk about the 2020 elections before we do that. Uh, Senator Nichols, you were on the ballot last time. You were not on the ballot again, right? Correct. Representative Ashby, you are running again. That is correct. You are confirmed to, to seek office again. Is this a good election cycle to run in, Representative Ashby, given the last one? I mean, I understand that a dead Republican could beat a live Democrat in your district. I understand that. You're not at risk. Um, however, however, uh, this is going to be an interesting election season, is it not? It is. Do you think Texas is in play, as some people think, seem to think at the national level, that somehow Texas is at risk of flipping politically? I don't. I don't. I, I, there's no doubt that uh, storm clouds are on the horizon uh, for our Republican brand in Texas. But in terms of the immediate uh, next cycle of 2020, no, I don't believe Texas Can you is going to I'm interested to hear you say that. I may take another hour and ask you to talk at length about what that means. <laughs> what, what storm clouds are on the horizon, Representative Ashby? You got my attention. Well, I think it, when you look at uh, some of the other uh, nationally, you, you said nationally, right? Nationally. Yeah. So, you know, you got to, if we're talking about, say, the presidential election nationally, I mean, obviously you're talking about electoral votes. You got to look at what those, those other swing states are, are doing. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I hate to use this because I, as I'm, I agree with Senator Nichols. I'm not a big polling guy. But that's not to say I don't look at polling from time to time. And certainly, if you do take away one takeaway from some of the national polling that's been done, uh, is that uh, you know uh, our, our president has some headwinds. Ahead Gives of you him. pause. Gives well, you he pause. doesn't give me pause. He j I just know he's got some headwind. Right. And uh, you know, while I appreciate the bold leadership that he's provided, I know that uh, in certain parts of the country that uh, maybe that hasn't been as welcome. And so nationally. Uh, I do think that, uh, you know, we're going to have to think very strategically and smart about yeah. uh, this upcoming election all the way down the ballot. But as, as it pertains to Texas, no, I feel very comfortable in the Republican brand. Do you think the Texas House, as some have said, is in play, control of the Texas House in the next election? Well, you are putting me on the spot here, aren't yeah. you? Uh, I think that the Texas House is safely Republican. Uh, that's not to say that uh, we we may not lose a seat or two, uh, but as I understand, I think we have a nine-seat majority currently, uh, but I don't see a scenario where the Republicans are going to lose the majority in the Texas House, no. Senator Nichols, do you feel in any way uh, apprehensive, even though you're not on the ballot, about the next election cycle? On the House issue, I've always stayed out of House politics. Well, I mean, just so. generally speaking. <laughs> Probably smart these days especially. <laughs> Uh, we are taping this, by the way. Um, that's okay. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll repeat it. I stay okay. out of house okay. politics. Uh, Unless somebody's picking on one of my state reps. Right. And I'll vouch for that. He does. Is that right? Okay, good. <laughs> the, uh, Generally speaking. Last session, uh, the last election cycle was very interesting. Uh, uh, the Democrats were very activated. Uh, uh, Beto brought a lot of excitement with a lot of young people. So you had that excitement going. Uh, at the same time, Ted Cruz ran a terrible campaign. He just did a sloppy, terrible campaign. He knows it. I mean, I, I don't mind him hearing it. Uh, he's heard me say that before. And uh, Cornyn's not not that way. He started early. He's really working hard. Right. And so uh, I think what happened is that drove the numbers and made them look a lot different. So this, uh, this cycle will be different than last cycle. I do. Uh, you're dealing with a presidential cycle. Yeah, you got a controversial president, but he's getting some serious things done. I hope he doesn't give up on China and stays in there. Uh, uh, but and he's tackling some very tough issues. So I, I, th I think Texas will do quite well. Okay. Questions on either side of the room? Ma'am, I saw you get up and 
Let me call on you first, and then we'll come over here. You welcome to get up. You're good. Hi. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I'm Audrey Young, and I am uh, administrator at Nacogdoches ISD. I'm also on the school board for Apple Springs ISD. Right. And um, I want to first start by thanking you both for all your hard work as it relates to public education and the benefit that we that we are all we're receiving. So as I enter my 26th year of public education, I, the question that comes to me on a regular basis is, what's the sustainability? What are we looking forward to in the next legislative session on how we're going to keep up with right. what we're doing? So an excellent question, because while you all voted to put as much money as you did into public education in this biennium, the work isn't over. The work is just beginning. The assumption on the part of this individual and others is that you're going to continue to put that money in in future by any of Senator yeah. Nichols. I'll be happy to take a shot at that. The That's one of the reasons that the one cent sales tax increase, they wanted to try to constitutionally dedicate that. That way you had a sustained constitutionally dedicated fund to do that. We said no because... I don't think that's the right way to do it. But what you do have is a commitment from the legislature to do it. And you will have the same governor, lieutenant governor, maybe the same speaker, and uh, uh, so many of the same members of the legislature that were there that made that commitment. So you're so committed You're committed to putting commitment. that same amount of money in in the next budget that you did in this budget? Uh, yeah, we're not going to let you come short. Same? Can I? Yeah, absolutely. Can I yeah, speak please. to that as well? Let, yeah. let me just say, by the way, Audrey, congratulations on your recent doctorate degree. Thank you. Uh, in rural Texas, we know most everybody, so I know Audrey. <laughs> uh, but let me say this: uh, a little bit of a little bit of history here. So, uh, as a lot of folks in this room will not remember, in 2011, uh, the legislature uh, cut funding for public education first time in, in a long time. 5.4 billion. 5.4 right? billion. I remember the number very well because when I ran in that next cycle as a sitting school board president, that was a big reason why I ran because I knew Texas could do better and their children deserve better. And so for me, uh, I saw the outcome of and the importance of funding public education at the ballot box uh, and winning that election overwhelmingly against an incumbent. And I will tell you that I don't think on a bipartisan basis uh, you're going to see the legislature shirk from our responsibility that we've made in House Bill 3 in terms of investing our most important investment and our most important resource, which is our school children. Do, do you think that there's more work to be done on school finance reform outside of the work you did this session? In other words, rather than just saying this is the new status quo, we're going to stay where we've been, where we are now, that you're going to attack this even more in the next session? The There were a lot more things in the school finance bill that we've had the chance to talk about. There were a lot of moving parts in it, uh, many of which I'm very excited about. But we also recognize that as those are being implemented and yeah. the rules are written by TEA and so on, that some of them are going to have to be modified. Unintended so, consequences, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and so we know that we're going to be coming in at least the next two legislative sessions and be tweaking it. But the funding is what your question is about. And the legislature made you And you're committed to that. Go. Hi. Hello. My name is Lucy, and I have a two-part question for the two of you. Okay. First one is about all the religious exemption laws that are coming out. My question is, uh, why is... Uh, the discrimination and violation of the civil rights of queer people required to practice Christianity. My second question is, why do Republicans hate queer people? I, I, I had a really difficult time understanding what I'll, you were saying. I'll the repeat, first part, the, I'll repeat the second question. The I, question was, why do Republicans hate queer people? That was the question. Yes. That was I, the I don't think that's across the board. I think there's a lot of people that are very open-minded that do not have the discriminations that you hear about. Um, the first part of that question had yes. to do with discrimination related to religion. Religious exemption. Yeah. Yes, I, religious exemptions. Uh, being able to fire people for being trans or uh, not. Yeah. I, I, state, I, uh, people I, who I was not really actually aware of any laws that are on the books that were related to that. Oh, no, no, not a law on the books, proposed laws. And it's, it's. Well, there's people there's file stuff all right. the time. There's a million things that are filed. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they have a chance of being passed. So when you get into religious freedom, I, I don't think you're going to find the legislature going in and make uh, discriminating like that. Not by law. Awesome. Ma'am. Thank you. 
I'm Pam Frederick. I'm the mayor of Bullard, which is a small community of about 4,000 between Jacksonville and Tyler. Um, first off, I want to thank the, the Texas Tribune and Mr. Smith for bringing these gentlemen forward. This is the second legislative update that I've um, been with you, Mr. Smith. And the focus has primarily been on House Bills um, 2 and 3. There's a, a later House bill that is much more effective to my small community and maybe some of the smaller communities that are represented here, and it's House Bill 2439. It's the building materials um, bill. I, I just have a question about what the um, premise is for how did that bill get where it got? Um, what, what are the effects expected to have in small communities and, and, and like mine? And just for the benefit of people in the room, say what that is, just very quickly. Okay, House Bill 2439 basically removed the rights of cities to have um, overlay corridors. Like in Bullard, it, our, if you build on our, on our corridors, which is our major highways, it will primarily be commercial development. But um, we, we had an ordinance that said you had to use 90% masonry product because that's the way we wanted to develop as a small gr growing community. But House Bill 2439 negated that ordinance and it also negated our ability to uh, regulate even building materials. And as I understand it, there's some question about gas lines and some other things that um, we're no longer going to be able to regulate. Okay, Senator Nichols, you seem to know something about this. Go ahead. I, I'm very familiar with that bill. Um, it went through in the Senate. It went through business and commerce. I'm the vice chair of business and commerce. I not only <laughs> voted against that bill, I spoke heavily against it. Thank you, uh, Senator. It was strongly supported by the building industry. Uh, there, uh, un Unlike Bullard and down on the south end, I, ha I represent half of your city. Yes, I guess sir. you know that. Yes, sir, and we and, appreciate that. Thanks. And... Um, on the far south of the district is Conroe. They did the same thing in their industrial park. They wanted masonry. And the builders, and there's probably some builders in this room, uh, there are some cities that use that almost to the extent where they it specifies whose building materials you can use. And that was their argument because they, they, they restricted it so tightly that only a few people could supply what it was that they specified. And that's what they were really targeting. Yes, sir. But it, the bill was so broad, it prohibited yes, you from doing what you feel like is best for you. I'm yes, a former sir. city councilman and mayor. I know. <laughs> and I was, I really was against that bill. And well, so thank I, you. I, I, I so this is, this is a, 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 you think this is a, an infringement upon local control? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. And, yeah. and um, when I ask a, a different state representative from my area about it, he said, Pam, it's just aesthetics. Well, it's not just aesthetics. That, that's, not, that's not the premise of the whole bill. It's more than aesthetics. Basically, yes. the builders, and I support them on a lot of stuff, and the realtors uh, uh, were uh, supportive of that bill. They, they basically wanted, in some areas, they want to be able to build a cheaper home, a wood yes. frame home, yes. and it's cheaper to build a wood frame home if you're doing uh, spec houses right. than it is a brick house or a rock at home. And so, Was there any consideration, Senator, about um, separating commercial from residential development? Uh, you could probably go in there and try to tweak it next session. Uh, if, okay. If, if, I would encourage, a very good question, I'm encouraging Mayor. everyone to do yeah. that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sir, Mr. Rosser, how are you? Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Curious, as we wrap up today, a lot of the things that we've talked about, the federal funding for health care, for example, um, has to do with the census. And we're coming into census season. Right. The, the legislator had an opportunity to, to focus on a complete count at the state level, chose not to do that for a reason I'm not familiar with. But we are in, in rural Texas trying to make sure that we're properly counted. I know the representative was chair of the Angelina County Complete Counts Committee in the last census. So I'm curious what the right. thoughts are on getting a complete count, the importance of the census and federal funding based on that and legislative seats and other issues. Right. Again, apportionment does have impacts, Absolutely. real impacts on Texas. And the state, as far as I know, has chosen not to involve itself in marketing the importance of getting everybody counted. We whiffed. We whiffed. We whiffed. Who's we in this case, Representative well, we, we as the legislature whiffed on this issue, and I couldn't agree more with Dr. Rosser in terms of uh, the importance, the importance of having every Texan counted in this upcoming census. It's vitally important. Uh, as I look around this audience, there, you know, this, is this is an engaged, educated uh, audience we have here today, and you know this, but Truly, when you talk about the federal dollars that flow to the state of Texas, it's based on our census count. When you talk about the apportionment of your representatives and your senators and your congressmen, 
your state board of education member who's in the audience today. It's based on census count. And as we talk about the challenges we face in Texas, one of the best things that we can do individually in this next, in this upcoming year is to stand up and be counted in this upcoming census. It really makes such a profound difference in terms of our representation, in terms of the monies that flow through our healthcare system, our schools. So why didn't you all do it? I mean, if you spend money to make money, you make back significantly more than you spend. You had the opportunity to do it. Why'd you whiff? Evan, I, the leadership wasn't there, and I'm, I'm disappointed. Senator Nichols, we still have an opportunity to correct this, do we not? As I understand it, there's a budget made available to the state to market the importance of everybody getting counted in the census. We just seem not to have activated. What's going on here? Uh, I really don't understand why they don't do it. Uh, I, I'm with Trent. Uh, the numbers count. M numbers do make a difference. They're going to make a big difference in our redistricting because it's immediately behind the census is the redistricting next right. session. I'm on the redistricting committee. I don't guess you're, but. Uh, we, might, we might get three additional congressional seats more than any other state based mm -hmm. on the growth of our population if we count the state's right. population accurately. And I, I think as right. we get to the census, you'll start seeing the money flowing. Okay. Let me take the last question over here, sir. I'm glad I'm the last question. <laughs> Larry Joyner with uh, Texas Farm Bureau. And this is for Senator, uh, excuse me, Representative Ashby. We both got it wrong. It's okay. We're good. <laughs> you, you, you jinx me. Yeah. Representative Ashby, I'd like to get your thoughts since you're on his blacklist. Uh, your thoughts on uh, Speaker Bonin and do you think he'll be back next year? And do you think he's just as much to blame as Chairman Craddock for the failure of the eminent domain? Wait a minute. Here's that five bucks I promised you. Here you go. <laughs> So the question was on the health care, health care crisis facing rural <laughs> Texas, right, Larry? Yeah. No, only more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, so uh, people in the room, some people in the room know that there's been a controversy involving the speaker in a taped meeting with a conservative activist who uh, doesn't seem to be a big fan of yours. And there's a question as to whether you and a few other members' names were uh, put on a list of potential targets by this conservative activist. There was an allegation of a quid pro quo in exchange for media credentials on the floor of the Texas House. On the one hand, it's inside baseball. On the other hand, I'm popping popcorn every day on behalf of everybody in Texas. Uh, questioner wants to know, where is this going? You're running for re-election. You're undaunted by this, right? We right. don't know what the Texas right. Rangers are investigating That's the right. allegations. Thank you. Yes. So, so to answer your question, Larry, and uh, normally I would say I appreciate you asking, but I'm not sure in this case. In this case, you do. That. I, however, do appreciate but, uh, I, I would say this, uh, you know, th th there is an ongoing uh, investigation into whether any laws were broken uh, in this uh, secret meeting uh, with the speaker and this activist. And, and uh, out of respect to the speaker, uh, who I have not had a chance to uh, uh, talk to personally, in person, uh, which I, will, I think I will have that opportunity next week when I'm in Austin. And by the way, it's, it, that's, it, that, I haven't been to Austin since June, which I'm very proud of that fact. So right. uh, I just haven't had a chance to visit with the speaker. But, but Representative but, Ashby, two months have passed, have passed since the speaker allegedly put your name on a hit list. Allegedly, he denies it. Two months have passed, and you have not talked to him in person. That is correct. That is correct. I, I haven't. Yeah. And I make no bones about it. I haven't been to Austin. Uh, most of you know I've got a full-time job here uh, running a bank. I've got uh, two boys in high school um, and a lot going on in our family. And you'll have to forgive me if I don't prioritize running over to Austin uh, to talk about Well, you could have just this. gone down to Lake Jackson. Uh, well, I guess that's true. But again, yeah. that just has not been a priority. So Mr. Joyner asked, will this, uh, do you believe that the speaker will be the speaker? Will the speaker be the speaker as we begin the 2021 session? And that's a fair question. And my answer to that is, Larry, look, as uh, has been self-admitted by the speaker, I mean, he's got a lot of work to do. There, there has clearly been some violation of trust with the, the membership of that body. Uh, you know, integrity uh, has been mentioned. Uh, I mean, you can't go and say, members, as a speaker, you can't say, you can't do this, and then allegedly turn around and do what you just said you can't do. And with, the context without, for that is that the speaker had said at the end of the session, we're not going to target incumbents of either party. Right. 
And so uh, I don't know what the future uh, is going to be for our current speaker. Uh, I know he's, uh, he's, he's diligently working hard to try to make amends uh, with those members that uh, allegedly were on this list. Uh, but I don't know. That is going to be up to the membership of the body. We're going to have an election, as we talked about earlier, between now and the next vote on the speaker. Uh, and I suspect that truly we won't know until uh, late next year when we know what the body will look like and who's going to be in the membership, uh, wh how that may turn out for the speaker. So we, yet to be determined is my answer. To your last point, quickly, uh, as we've talked about, uh, no one was more disappointed in the uh, failure of us to move our comprehensive eminent domain reform bill than two of the gentlemen sitting up on this stage. It's something that we have been proud to fight with uh, over the, since I've been in the legislature to find that meaningful reform for eminent domain. Our property owners across Texas, uh, it's clear to me and everybody that the, uh, the, the, the playing field is not level. And so next session, we're going to go back one more time with a better team and a bigger team, and we're going to push hard to make sure we get this across the finish line. So you're not willing to blame Speaker Bonin? I'm not going to cast blame on anybody right now. Well, I will. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ashby, on Mr. Joyner's behalf, let me ask you pointedly, if a vote were cast today for Speaker and the choice were to vote for or against Speaker Bonin, would you be a yes vote or a no vote? Well, it's a good thing there's not a vote today. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> that feels like a non-answer to me, but okay. Um, Senator Nichols, Representative Ashby, it is great to be in your community here at Angelina College. Thank you very much for your time. To everybody in the audience, thank you for coming. Dr. Simon and, and everybody else, President Simon, thank you very much. We'll see you again. Thank you.